So I am delighted to be here. It's a, it's a real honor. I think in the description of my experience, I so appreciate when people call into, um, into focus the, what has been the thread of all of my work, which is the intersection of practice policy and research. And that's certainly a focus of mine. It's the focus of the Harvard Grad School of Education. But I'm a high school guidance counselor. And my grandmother, uh, who passed away this past year, used to introduce me as a high school guidance counselor from Harvard. I, I then followed by saying, if only Harvard had high school guidance counselors supporting all their students. So, so in fact, my identity largely is around how we in K-12 set young people up for success in their post-secondary pathways. And the way that I've done that has varied. And I feel fortunate to have been able to do things in higher ed, in K-12, in research, in policy, and in overseeing Boston's Gear Up grant. So I come to you with my, all of that behind me in about 20 years of, of experience. And today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to address this question that uh, was put sort of in your materials for today, which asks, what does it take to ensure that each and every student has the opportunity to aspire to, plan, and prepare for college success? I assume that's why most of you are here, unless there's a meal I haven't heard about. But that if you're here, for the question part, this is the question that sort of drove my work and continues to drive what I do uh, today. And it started in a position I had, my very first position as a high school guidance counselor for ninth graders in a high school in Boston. I was hired as the first ever ninth grade counselor by a headmaster who said, I want you to provide early college awareness to students. I figured, how hard can that be? I was just out of graduate school and figured I'd, I'd figure it out along the way, but I needed a job. And so one of the things that I did when I started my work is I would bring the ninth graders into our new college and career center, brand new space with banners and information and tables and all the sorts of things that we know young people need to aspire to and plan for college. And I'd start these workshops with about 30 students by saying, how many of you want to go to college? And like I think most of you would expect, about 30 hands would fly up in the air. And I'd take a moment and either think to myself, this job's gonna be a piece of cake or I'd already done a terrific job and the truth is neither were in fact true. It wasn't easy, and it was not something I had done. In fact, lots of students came to me with aspirations of wanting to go to college. They knew that was the right answer. They had heard college is important. But it didn't take me long to find, after that day or week or whenever I had to have them in the College and Career Center, to find that many of the students whose hands were in the air didn't come to school regularly. Some of them didn't carry backpacks or do homework. And some of them would not come to the enrichment programs with Boston University or the community college or any of the things that we had in place to expose them to college preparation. And yet their hands were in the air as if they wanted to go. And so much of my work at my time at this particular high school and beyond has been thinking about what happens between the students who put their hands in the air and say they want to go and their actual behaviors and their follow through. Why is it that the job that I started with 350 ninth graders ended four years later with 190 seniors, 30% of whom went on to college. And you know the data. You know how many of them actually received a college degree. So in this work, I begin by talking about college and career readiness. And inevitably, people want to know what I mean by college. So I start here with John Bluto Blutarski, who wears a sweatshirt with college emblazoned on it. And you all do know this is John Belushi, right? Sometimes people think it's Jack Black, but those are my 22-year-old students. <laughs> so, John Belushi wears this sweatshirt with college emblazoned on it as if college is one thing. And when I give talks, people ask questions. Well, what do you mean by college? Do you believe in a college for all mentality? Or do you think that not all students should go to college? And after I've given a talk, most people realize that my interest is not in the, in the outcome. My interest is that young people have the skills and the resources and the capacities to make their own decisions about what pathway is right for them. And it's not about us deciding which pathway is right for them. But to do that, we have to know what skills and capacities they need. So I don't side on either place in the debate of college for all. I think we know that college is the pathway to economic security. It's important for our country, and it's important for students and the communities in which they live. But where they go, whatever that is, is up to them. And we need them to make the choices. Which leads me to the second thing that's different from John's sweatshirt from today, in that as college doesn't mean one thing. We use it as a word to describe a post-secondary opportunity. But higher education today is widely diverse, with two-year schools and four-year schools and community colleges. In fact, we no longer think of it as a place in some ways, with virtual and online courses. We have private schools. We have specific professional schools. We have historically black colleges and Hispanic-serving institutions. We have tribal colleges. 
We have students who go to college at home and far away to private liberal arts schools and to local agricultural colleges. So when we talk about college, it's not so much about the where, but that's a post-secondary opportunity. And so it's a much more nuanced and diverse conversation today. But when I use college, I mean all of those things, all of the opportunities that await young people. And the final, third and final difference today is that what was once relegated to a single person, the high school guidance counselor, is now work that's shared among many people. It's shared by community-based providers, gear up advisors, teachers, schools who build college-going cultures, churches, families, peers, everybody has taken shared responsibility for making sure young people have what they need to pursue post-secondary education. This is not what I mean by college, nor do I mean the experience that Bluto had in National Lampoon's Animal House. So what do we know? We've come a long way indeed. The field has generated enough research that we feel we have a pretty good handle on what young people need to prepare for college. And you know this. This is what drives your work every day. This is what drives the gear up programming, the community-based college readiness programming, knowing that young people need both ac access to academic rigor as well as aspirations, information, instrumental supports. They need the money. They need the literacy around finances. And we've done a great deal in the past 10, 15 years to make sure there are lots of things in place. Many more programming than ever before. I go into cities that say years ago they had federal trio programs like Talent Search and now today have over 100 college access and readiness programs in a single area. It's grown widely to make sure there are policies in place, policies that make it so that the FAFSA is manageable, doable, readable, and that colleges and universities standardize their awards letters. Policies have changed, schools have changed to build college-going cultures, people have changed. There's a great deal in place. And you'd think that with all of this in place, we would have come a long way. And yet, when we look at the population with whom I've focused much of my work, and that is students who come from low-income communities, students who are the first in their family to go to college, and students who come from minority backgrounds that are underrepresented in higher education, we still see students falling off the pipeline. You know this, again, it's what drives your work. Out of any given 10 students who fit the criteria I describe, we can almost anticipate that at least two and a half of them will fail to complete high school. About five of them will fail to attend, to fit, to attend college, rather. And only three out of the original 10 will ultimately receive a college degree. And for those of you who have been doing this work, you know who those three people are. Those are the three students who were living and breathing college. They were in every program, they were in your office, at your doorstep. They showed up for my Saturday program every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Those are the students who tend to take advantage of lots of resources. And yet what I can't quite figure out is if there's so much in place, is it that we need more or is it that we need different? And the work that Suzanne Buffard and I have done has been asking that question. Could it be that we need different or that we need to think about how we do the work and not what we do? The gaps that exist across the pipeline, there's a couple of ways to think about them. Certainly we're seeing gains in enrollment, but we also know that there are still gaps with regard to degree completion. It's taking longer for students to complete college. They're over-enrolling in developmental education courses, which are costly and don't carry credits. Higher education is becoming more expensive and students are choosing to work rather than take out huge loans. And still programs continue to serve overall a, large, a small percentage of students. Oftentimes I hear people in some cities say we're over-servicing the same students. I'm not so sure we can over-service students. I think they need all the supports that we have available. But as a result, there are a group of students who aren't getting anything. And they tend to be the students in the middle, the ones for whom it's harder to show positive outcomes, the students who may not be signing up for all the programs and taking advantage of all the resources. And still, when we look at that population, one thing we can consider is do they really see themselves as a college goer? Do we attribute the problem to us and our, our work, or do we try to understand students differently? So when we set out to do this work, we wanted to look at what was currently in place. And if you look at programming, college readiness and preparation program, you can see we've paid a lot of attention to academic readiness. In fact, for a long time, that's all we talked about. Students need academic skills. But we've expanded to emphasize the importance of making sure students have information, they know what's available to them, that we can pay attention to building the financial resources that students need. But all of these things are in fact very important and I would certainly not stand up here and say that we don't need to give information, that we don't need to take students on college visits and spend time on college campuses. 
However, I think what we're missing in all of this is whether or not we're paying attention to the skills and capacities that young people need to take advantage of these resources. How do we understand the students who don't sign up? How do we understand the students who go on a college visit only to leave and feel like college isn't in fact for them? That it only reinforce that they don't have a college going identity. And so the development of a college going approach, a developmental approach to college going is asking this question, what's missing? What else can we add to what we're doing? Fortunately, we can rely on a large body of research from developmental psychology to understand the why behind adolescents' behaviors. Certainly, doctors all the time rely on behavioral health. Doctors need to know what treatments work for what illnesses, right? They need to know, if my patient has X, what treatment do I give them? But they also need to understand why sometimes patients don't do what they tell us to do. Certainly, you might have been told by your doctor to exercise more, eat better, lower your cholesterol, reduce your sugar. Lots of times we have information that we don't act on. This man might have some information he's not acting on right now. He's choosing the donut. In my case, it will be a bag of potato chips. To be clear, Cape Cod, kettle, cooked, potato chips. <laughs> Just take note of that. So we all know that making choices is not about having information, and yet I will tell you how many times I had a student come back to me after he or she left Brighton High School and said, Miss, you never told me dot, 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 insert whatever you like. I often would walk them back to said college and career center and actually reenact said workshop where I said to them the information they just said I never said. Information is not enough. Some students aren't ready to hear it. Some students aren't able to use it. Behavioral health helps us understand that. Developmental psychology looks at how the research and development can give us clues and to help students make better decisions. To understand why students complete a FAFSA form and never hit submit or who work on their essay and never send it in, who say, yes, 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 miss, I'll be there, but don't show. I used to offer the PSAT at Boston University, and I would inevitably have about 40% of the students who signed up show up. What goes on between the intentions and the behaviors? And that, I believe, is where behavioral science can give us some clues. So with that in mind, we offer a developmental approach. And in the book, Ready, Willing, and Able, that Marcy so thoughtfully held up and waved, which not neither Suzanne or I thought to bring with us today, but it is available on Amazon, <laughs> is a book called Ready, Willing, and Able, where we talk about a developmental approach in this way. And that is, if we can set aside time and resources and practices that pay attention to things like identity, the first two areas, envisioning oneself as a college goer and believing in the ability to succeed, seeing themselves, building a college going identity in a way that takes into account beliefs, and they can set the kinds of goals in the aiming category that are going to set them up for success. And we can teach them skills and self-regulation that account for planning and organization and the delay of gratification and, and all the skills that we know young people need for success in school. And we can connect them to the kinds of people, their peers, their family members, and other adults, that they can marshal the kinds of supports. Then we're paying attention to development. And so we offer this in a cycle intentionally. These things build off each other. And we can come in in a lot of the work that we're doing and embed some of what we know from developmental psychology into what we're doing without necessarily changing the specific practices that we have in place, but doing so with an eye towards development. What I'd like to do today is to talk about three, three developmental processes that I believe can influence the work that you do. And that is identity development, motivation, and self-regulation. And I won't talk quite as much about marshalling supports, although in the, the book we have a chapter on how to marshal the supports of peers and family members. And I know Suzanne will talk a little bit later today about family members as well. So beginning with identity. Many times when we talk about college readiness, we talk about building a college-going identity. How many of you have thought about your work as helping students build a college-going identity? A few of you? In fact, this comes out of all the research that talks about the importance of aspirations and expectations. And if young people don't aspire to go to college, they're unlikely to go. In fact, some research shows that if a student doesn't have the aspiration to go to college by the eighth grade, they are less likely to actually enroll. Aspirations matter. College-going identity is one way to do that. And the way that we currently go about it is we make sure that students are exposed to all the post-secondary options. We use college months, where we ask faculty to wear sweatshirts or college day. We ask uh, people to develop college and career centers where we hang banners and make information available. We do a lot of things to make sure that the information is there and we can raise expectations. We build college-going cultures where everyone expects students to go to college. These are all important things because they do, in fact, raise aspirations. 
But has anyone here ever heard of Eric Erickson? Some of you may have taken a psychology class where you learned about identity development. If I asked you how much you rely on Eric Erickson to do your college-going identity work, I would bet you'd say not at all, even those of you who knew him, probably because that said psychology class that you, talk, that you took didn't really connect Eric Erickson's work of identity development to college-going. That's why we're here. In fact, we know quite a lot about identity. We know how identity develops. It doesn't necessarily develop because we tell people they can do something. Simply telling students they can go to college does not necessarily mean they're going to adopt that identity. Just think if someone told me that I could be an opera singer and said that I should go to school, to Juilliard, to be a musician, to be a singer. I can tell you that wouldn't happen, first and foremost, because I can't sing. Really, I can't sing. But when we think about identity, we can draw on the work of Erickson and Marcy and others in developmental psychology that tell us how identity gets formed. So let me share a little bit of that with you today, because we all think about future-oriented identities. When young people are developing identities, which adolescents are doing quite a lot of, by the way, in adolescence, middle schools and high schools, figuring out who they are takes up a lot of their time. You know this because you see it in how they dress, who they hang out with, what music they listen to, what they do, what they don't do, the friends they take. All of that is searching for who am I and who do I want to be. What kind of person do I want to be? What's OK and what's not OK? What happens if I do this? And they test out different identities. And all the while they're doing that, we're trying to create college-going identities at the same time. The trick here is that identity development is about helping students integrate different parts of their identity. They all have different parts. We all have different parts. Some people who talk about identity categorize identity into different areas. There's one that I like, which is we can think of our identity as the groups to which we belong, our race, our demographics, our gender, our political affiliations, our baseball team affiliations, just saying, Red Sox fan in the room. So you can think about your membership in that way. You can think about your identity in a second area, and that is the roles that you play in your life. Sister, mother, teacher, counselor, friend, partner, and the roles that you play in your work and in your life. And the third area is your self-concept. When people talk about identity and identity development in particular, they talk about the integration, the making sure the parts fit together. Because when the parts don't fit together, or they feel like they don't fit together to someone, they reject the identity. And what happens for some young people is they reject a college-going identity. James Marcia, who's the person who introduced this term called foreclosure, says, foreclosure happens when students reject a potential identity without exploring it, without having information. Now, sure, I bet some of us here have foreclosed on some careers. I've foreclosed on a lot of careers. Again, opera singing being one of them. And we foreclose on them because we've explored, we've tried things out, we've examined whether or not they're feasible, if they're a good fit. But sometimes students foreclose without all the right information, which is why we spend so much time giving them information. But foreclosure also happens when things or parts of their identity don't seem to fit together or they feel in conflict. And this is where it gets hard. Students feel things are in conflict even when they're not. Do you remember when there was all the research about young girls choosing careers in science? Believe that young women started to feel that being a scientist was inconsistent with being a female. Those two parts of their identity didn't seem to fit together. And so when our work in identity development with students and thinking about building college-going identities means we have to take into account all the different parts of their identity, but also how they draw meaning from it. The tricky part is some parts of identity are visible. Sometimes we can see dimensions of identity, or we might think we see them. And some parts of identity development are invisible. Certainly self-concept is not something we can see. Some students here we can see are female or male, or African American or Indian, are with disability, are Hispanic. We can see some parts of identity, but we can't see it all. And even more so, sometimes students don't even see different parts of their self-concept or realize that they're being formed or how important they are to themselves. So let me give you an example of how identity and perceptions of identity might play into how someone sees themselves as a college goer. Take the example of two young men, both immigrants to the United States, Hector and Ralph. Hector emigrated from Ecuador. During the immigration process, his family spoke a lot about the importance of coming to the United States for a better life, having a chance for an education and opportunities for better outcomes. For him, being an immigrant was very consistent with going to college. For him, going to college and the dreams that he had were part of the immigrant experience and satisfying his parents' dreams as well. But for Ralph, who had recently immigrated from Haiti, 
has heard a lot about how difficult it is for undocumented students to get access to the finances to go to college, and how undocumented immigrants don't have access to, state, uh, to federal aid and as a result can't go. For him, his immigration, his immigrant identity, feels in conflict with going to college. Same dimension of identity, two different interpretations. And sometimes we know this because our students tell us how they feel, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes their experiences and their identities haven't been brought to the surface. They haven't actually stopped to reflect on them. Different parts of people's identity feel important at different times. My identity as an educator right now feels pretty prominent. But my identity as a mom felt pretty prominent yesterday when I was saying goodbye to my family at the airport. Context changes things, and we bring into our awareness our different parts of our identity. And our work with students in building, co building college-going identities need to take into account, yes, the envisioning, but also the believing. The believing parts of whether or not college can be for me. And that means finding out what they believe to be true about themselves and about the groups to which they belong. Difficult work, certainly. When we look at programming, and when I look back at my work, I think I did a lot on the side of envisioning. I did a lot of envisioning, a lot of inventing what's possible. I did less of the believing. I think if I had followed up my question to those ninth graders in the College and Career Center with the question, how many of you expect to go to college, I might have gotten a different answer. I don't know. But I think there's a, there's a big gap between envisioning and believing. And the belief systems are harder to figure out. They're not as, they're not as much in our face. And this is where I think some of the work in building college-going identities can take place. There are lots of ways to think about helping students integrate their parts of their identity, but the, the other piece that I'd like to emphasize is the piece about self-concept. Self-concept or someone's belief in, in who they are, their traits, their qualities. When I ask students to tell me about their identity, ultimately they'll name things like their demographics, but they'll say things like outgoing, social, athletic. Those are parts of their self-concept, what they believe they're good at. And self-concept is very much in play when students are thinking about whether or not college is for them. And there's a huge body of research on self-concept. But there's one idea in particular that I take from self-concept that I believe is relevant to college going and has been linked to college going behaviors. And that's of self-efficacy. And to talk about self-efficacy today with you all, I'd like to use the example of running. Because I have recently started doing some running with some other people in my neighborhood very early in the morning. In these meetings, we've been talking a lot, in these running, we've been talking a lot about possibly running a marathon. Now, as you heard from Vicki, I come from Boston, and as you know, Boston experienced a pretty terrible tragedy last spring. There are a lot of Bostonians who are ready to reclaim the Boston Marathon, I being one of them. So the thought of running the Boston Marathon is pretty compelling. I aspire to do it. I want to do it. Can I do it? I'm not so sure. Because it depends on whether or not my self-efficacy as a runner would lead me to then engage in some activities that would prepare me to run in the marathon and not collapse at mile two. So I think about this marathon example. I certainly recognize I've used this example of the Boston Marathon long before the incident took place last spring. But it's useful to think about how students build college-going self-efficacy in talking about this. So let's think about it. If I wanted to run the, a marathon or the Boston Marathon, I'd think first, can I do it? Do I have the skills? Just because people tell me I can do it doesn't mean I can doesn't mean I'll get up first thing in the morning at 5 a.m. when my alarm goes off. Doesn't mean that when it's cold and dark in Boston in February that I will wake up early and leave the house. But self-efficacy literature and research gives us some clues into how we help build self-efficacy in students. And if we think about building students' self-efficacy as college goers, what we realize is that it can give us a way to, to target their self-concept relative to building a college-going identity. So what is self-efficacy? It's the belief in the ability to accomplish a specific task. Part one, belief in your ability to accomplish a specific task. Can I run a marathon? And the ability to persist in the face of obstacles. There will be obstacles for students transitioning to college who are first in their family. There will be academic obstacles, there will be financial obstacles, and there will be social obstacles. Maybe not all three, but there will be one. Anticipating that there are means that building their self-efficacy sets them up to believe they can overcome them. That, that confronting obstacles, whatever they may be, is not the thing that puts them off the path. So when we think about self-efficacy, there's two points I'd like to make. The first is that this is domain specific. What that means is it's not like you either have self-efficacy or you don't. Like self-esteem, either you have high self-esteem or you have low self-esteem. This means we have self-efficacy in lots of different areas of our life. 
I have very low self-efficacy when it comes to directions. I could get lost anywhere. Suzanne knows because we've traveled together and inevitably I ask her to walk me places. When I came down for coffee this morning, the woman at the front desk said there was a Starbucks right here or an Einstein two blocks over, one block down and another block over. You can guess I went to Starbucks. So all the things that I do because I have this fear of getting lost, I don't think I can manage myself out of a paper bag, shapes what I do and the choices I make. The panic that sets in when I see that orange detour sign, even though there will be 10 more orange detour signs leaving me. Self-efficacy is useful because students may not believe that they have the ability to go to college or be successful once they're there, to maintain them the academics that are necessary, or to transition to the culture of a college student based on what they know about college. So when we think about self-efficacy and we think, okay, well then how do we build the self-efficacy relative to college going with students? There are four things that research says we can do. The first is make sure that people have mastery of experience. I ran a 5K and I actually completed it. So <laughs> thank you very much, that's a lot for me. So mastering the experience means I've tried it and it went well, therefore my belief in my ability to do it is strengthened. This is why we put so much emphasis on things like dual enrollment programs where students get to try out college or we take them on college visits. The second is vicarious learning. This is seeing other people do it. Right? The day after the marathon in almost any city, I would bet you sneaker sales go up a lot. We see people doing this and we think, I can do that. I only saw them for about 10 meters, but still, I think I could do what they're doing. This is why we bring in alums to talk to students about their experiences. We want students to see the vicarious opportunities of their peers, of alums from the same schools. That builds self-efficacy. I've done it before and I've seen others do it. I know what it looks like. The third is social persuasion. This is the thing we're really good at. We tell students they can do it. Of course you can go to college. You have the skills. You can do it. This is my husband. He's a glass half full person on everything. Of course you can run a marathon. He's six foot three and his legs are much longer than mine. So social persuasion. And the last one is affect. Affect describes the state that someone's in. Are they in the state where they can truly assess their abilities? If their mental health is compromised or they're in a state of stress, or they're not well, they're ill, their ability to sort of build self-efficacy is compromised. Now while all of these things matter to the building of self-efficacy, I will tell you that research suggests that mastery of experience is pretty important. Giving students the opportunity to try something and feel efficacious about it will go a long way. For me, simply watching other people work out of directional challenges is not enough. But every time I manage to find myself through a new city or through a new route, it builds my self-efficacy. So this is self-efficacy, again, one concept of building self-concept. So going back to where I started a college-going identity, building a college-going identity includes raising aspirations. It includes making sure students know what options are out there. But it also means paying attention to how their identity is formed, who they are, what the many parts of their identity are, and how we help them integrate the different parts of their identity so that college-goer fits nicely and completely with other parts that matter to them that they're not choosing college going instead of something else, but in tandem with. And that it's in tandem with their self-concept. And their self-concept comes from things like self-efficacy and other abilities that we can pay attention to in our work. The second developmental concept today I want to talk about is motivation. I think this is an important one. And if you read Ed Week or you get the Ed Week announcement, which I get, you'll notice that almost every day there is a webinar on Carol Dweck's work or Daniel Pink's work on motivation because we know so much now about how we understand motivational uh, disposition relative to learning. And when I go out and talk to people who run college access programs, inevitably when I ask them what the mission of their organization is or what they choose to do, they say, we want to motivate young kids to go to college. Maybe you would, you would include that in the things that you do as well. It's certainly what I did when I was a counselor. In fact, we talk about motivation a couple different ways. Have you ever heard someone say this? She's just not that motivated, or he's not that motivated. I've said this, I've heard colleagues say this, because we're thinking about motivation in a very limited way. And we turn to the motivational, the research on motivation, we learn a few things about how motivational dispositions get formed. And a few misconceptions are helpful here. The first is that people talk about motivation as either, a, either you have it or you don't, kind of like a binary quality. People are motivated. Have you ever met someone you felt wasn't motivated? Well, what we know is actually everybody has the potential to be motivated. Sometimes students are just not motivated to do the things we want them to do. 
Sure, students are motivated to hang out with friends, go to ball games, play video games, go to church, help their parents. We're motivated to do lots of things, but sometimes the things that we are asking them to do, they're not engaged in doing, and we interpret it. We interpret it as lacking motivation. Everybody has the predisposition for motivation. The second misconception is that this is something we can give someone. I want to motivate you. I'm going to give them motivation. Well, the people who study, research, study motivation would tell us this is not something you can impart on somebody, to someone else. We can't give it to someone. We can set the conditions up so that people can develop it on their own. The way that we do that, however, means not just telling people they can go to college, not just telling them it's possible for them, but paying attention to what researchers call adaptive motivation. So this is how people think about it, people who look deeply at motivation. That is, motivation is the beliefs and the goals that drive action and associated behaviors conducive to success and well-being. If you see nothing else on this slide, what was Vicky's thing? If this is the most important thing I say to you ever, what was the thing she had to say to her son three times? Now you have to hear this, beliefs and goals, the most important part of understanding motivation. Understanding motivation means helping young people de develop the kinds of goals that matter that will keep them moving towards a particular outcome and developing the belief systems that will uh, engage them in the process. We miss the beliefs and goals in a lot of our motivation work, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this today. The first part is goals. How many of you have seen a chart like this before? How many of you have used a chart like this before? I've used this chart. Why do we use this chart? We use it because we want to entice students to want to go to college, right? Look at how much more money you'll make if you go to college. I already said that, that going to higher education is in fact the pathway to economic security. This is true and this does matter. So keep using this chart. You all thought I was going to tell you not to use it. I know. This chart is good, but it's limited. It's limited for a few reasons. First, it's limited because if you ever work with young students, like those middle schoolers, it's a long way away, right? That associate's degree is at least six plus years away. So getting students excited about something that's not coming for a long time is really quite tough. Especially if you're going to ask me to do something on a Saturday morning, get up early and travel across the city to go to a program because it's going to help me in six years, not going to happen. You want me to not get a job over the summer where I'm going to get paid money? Because you want me to go to an enrichment program? Because in six years, it's going to matter? It's a long way away. The second reason why it's a little troubling is because money can sometimes feel intangible. The dollar amounts don't necessarily mean anything when you're working with students. Sometimes it does. But even with good intentions, what seems like a lot of money is not necessarily a lot of money. And what they would do with it isn't always clear. But the reason why charts like this are insufficient on their own Right? I said you should still keep using it. Insufficient on their own is because it uses money as an extrinsic reward. It suggests that the reason that students should go to college is because they'll make more money, setting up only extrinsic rewards for doing so. Now certainly intrinsic and extrinsic rewards are things we, we all know about, right? Intrinsic, doing things because we take enjoyment, satisfaction, extrinsic because of some reward. Whether that reward is monetary or social, people will like me more or at some other tangible outcome. I sometimes find students who come to Harvard University because of the social prestige. And guess what? Not always a good fit for them. But it was a very extrinsic motivator. Extrinsic rewards, of course, work sometimes. Let's be real. I mean, I have, did I mention I have twins who are four? I potty trained them. Do you think I used extrinsic rewards? Of course I did. I used little mini marshmallows. And every time they went to the bathroom, they got a mini marshmallow which of course meant that they went to the bathroom a lot, even when they didn't need to. Now, of course, because they're stuck with me as their mom, they weren't done after the marshmallow. I also needed to ask them to give me a proud hug, or to call someone and tell them how proud they were of being a big girl. Because while I also want to recognize that they're going to do things for extrinsic rewards, I want to build the intrinsic value. I want them to also see the intrinsic value of being a big girl who uses the potty. So, my husband's horrified that I tell this story in large audiences. So when we think about talking with students about the reasons they go to college, we certainly can use things like extrinsic rewards, but it's not enough on its own. And what the research on this tells us, Desi and Ryan and others who've studied this, is that solely relying on these make it so that when people face difficulties, they face obstacles, 
It's easy to step off the path when the only reason they're doing it is for an extrinsic reward if it's not for them. It's not something that they're internally driven to do. Some people who study this say that people who are doing things for extrinsic reasons, they lack creativity, they're less involved in it, and they sometimes can experience it as being controlling. I'm only doing this because of this outcome or this reward. And so when we think about talking with students, we should help them identify the intrinsic value of going to college, of all the different parts of the experience. But of course, if you've been involved in helping students take the necessary steps to go to college, you know there are some parts of the process that are not all that intrinsically enjoyable, right? Studying for the SAT. Who took a lot of intrinsic satisfaction from studying for the SAT? If you're like me, you didn't take much intrinsic satisfaction from taking physics class either. That's why Desi and Ryan offer a third type. They talk about something called internalized regulation, which is sometimes people may not actually feel the intrinsic satisfaction or inherent value of it, but they attribute the value of it to some longer term goal. They can see that though I don't really enjoy physics class, it is essential that I succeed and engage in physics because it is essential for my long term goal that I want to achieve. For me, that's waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning that is not at all enjoyable to go for the run because I like the way I feel when I get home. It is central to the long term goal. It's in service to the long-term goal that I have. So talking about, ex talking about motivation means talking about the goals. Not if they have goals, but the kinds of goals they have. What are the reasons for going to college? This quote comes from a study that some of our colleagues did at Boston College, and a student in this study says, there's a difference between wanting to go to college and someone telling you they want you to go to college. Because when you go to college for reasons you don't know why, then you drop out because you don't know why you're there. You're going for someone else. It's like a promise you're keeping that's not yours. It's not your own promise. I imagine that some of you have talked with students who say the reason that they want to go to college is to make their families proud. That's certainly a very good reason. But we also want to help students internalize the other benefits of going to college, the things that matter to them. And there are a couple of ways we can do this. There's one that strikes me as always very relevant. Has anyone here read this book, Hope in the Unseen? The story of a young boy named Cedric Jennings who grew up in Washington, D.C. and went to Ballou High School. He went on to Brown University, struggled along the way, and graduated. He was an engineering and finance major at Brown University. Today, he's a social worker for the Department of Children and Youth Services in Washington, D.C. And when he goes around the country now and he talks, he talks about how he originally thought of going to college as a way out, a way out of the ghetto, a way out of where he lived in the community he was in. But in fact, going to college was his way back in his way to give back to his community. Being a social worker in DC allows him to use this post-secondary opportunity to change his community. We can think differently about how we talk to kids about identifying reasons for going to colleges. We have to be careful about having them see going to college as a way out, when in fact giving back might be central to why they want to do it. The second part of motivation is the belief system. So I said that motivation is about goals and beliefs, the kinds of goals that students set but also the beliefs about their ability to achieve them. And here I'm just going to talk about one thing. I'm going to borrow from the work of Carol Dweck and others who talks about a fixed versus growth mindset. Again, you remember at the beginning I said there are things we can pull from developmental psychology literature that can help us understand students. Carol Dweck and her colleagues identified this concept of growth versus um, fixed mindset. And the idea is that a growth mindset is one in which we believe intelligence is not fixed. It is something that we can improve upon and get better. Versus fixed is you're born with it, that's all you have, there's no changing it. What's interesting about this is that Carol Dweck and her colleagues have done a great deal of research on this. And one of the interventions and studies that they did, they pulled a group of middle school students into a control group and an experiment group. In the experiment group, they taught the students that the brain is like a muscle, and the harder you work at it, the bigger and stronger it gets. And with the control group, they just gave them a lesson on the brain. Sure enough, as predicted, this, they found that the students who learned that the brain is a muscle worked harder. They engaged in their academic experience differently. They were willing to, to take more risks and followed through on more academic assignments. What's interesting, one of the interesting things about her work, is not so much about whether or not the fixed or growth mindset exists. It's not so much about whether or not it's true. It's the perception of its truth that matters. When students believe that if they work hard, they can get better at something, they're more likely to work hard. If they believe there's a fixed outcome, it doesn't matter what they do, 
that if they take the PSAT and get a score, no matter what classes they take or whatever they do, they're likely to get the same score. The reality here is that we need to teach students to have growth mindsets about lots of parts relative to college going, getting in, getting smart, and reaching their goals. So we think about motivation, much like I said with college going identity. Here we see a, a mouse who says, you think cheese will motivate me? No, I want mutual funds. We can think about motivation as goals and belief systems. And the goals is helping understand the goals that matter for students, helping them become either intrinsically valuable or internalizing their value for some long-term goal, and also paying attention to the kinds of beliefs they bring to the process. Now, I'm not going into depth here, and, and we certainly do more of this in the book, but just to sort of name, if your interest is in motivating young people to go to college, it means attending to the goals and the belief systems, not telling them that, yes, you believe you can go. So the last thing I want to talk about today is self-regulation. This is a topic that is also quite popular these days. You may have heard about it referenced as executive functioning or self-control or self-management. There's a great new video that's being shown on Sesame Street this season, just in case you're interested, with Cookie Monster singing a song about self-control relative to cookies. It's actually really, really good. So self-regulation. This concept is in particularly valuable as I think very much back to many of the things that I did with students relative to their college planning. One counselor said this to me. She said, after spending lots of time talking about the importance of bringing in her paperwork for the summer program, she never did. It seemed that no matter what I did, she never followed up. Maybe you've had this experience of students who did not follow up with things, who set out to complete forms to sign up for things but didn't actually follow through. Well, students need not just to have the belief that they can go to college and the belief systems and the goals to get there. They need the planning, organizational, um, the regulatory skills to achieve those goals, to stay on task. And like motivation, self-regulation is not something that you have or you don't have. Some of us are better self-regulators than others. Some of us are very good at organizing. You know who you are. You go to the container store or some equivalent store and get very excited. I have students who come to see me and I'll notice that their notebooks have all of their assignments color-coded. All of them. I'm a planner. My husband is not. We are a match made in heaven. Or there's some learned helplessness going on. I'm not totally sure. But either way, some people are very good at planning. Some people are good at organizing. Some are good at delaying gratification. Some of them are good at reflecting and managing their behaviors. Self-regulation is a skill that very much manage, supports the college-going process as well. If you think about this skills, there's not just one skill, but self-regulation largely is the ability to manage thoughts and behaviors in the service of attaining a goal. Can I organize myself, control myself, engage in the right kinds of things that will help me reach my goal? Sometimes we think that students have these skills. If you study self-regulation, as some of my colleagues do, you'll find that self-regulatory skills begin to develop when kids are quite young, two, three, four, but they don't stop developing. In fact, they continue to develop well into adolescence and into young adulthood. We're still developing self-regulatory skills with students who are middle school and high school. And not all of them come with the same set of skills. Not all of them can take the FAFSA form home and remember to bring it back. My students, it got lost in the vortex that's known as the backpack. They never came back. Of course, I'm dating myself because you don't actually send in the FAFSA form anymore but rather submit it. So let's try this for a second. I'm going to ask you to avoid expressing any emotion. Self-regulation is what allows us to be in control. Some of you had trouble just controlling your emotions. I love that. I was watching. It's hard. It's hard to control. For me, if you put Jimmy Fallon up here, it doesn't matter what you tell me, I'd be laughing on the floor. I find him very, very funny. Self-regulation is associated with being in control of what you do, whether it's your emotions. Sometimes people have trouble controlling their emotions relative to things that make them angry, sad, happy managing their behaviors, controlling themselves. For my students, it's not opening Facebook or Gchat while I'm lecturing. I see them doing it. They think I don't know what it means if they do this. 
So we know that some people, it's harder than others. We also know that if you can think of self-regulation, as I have in this picture, as allowing us, allowing our brain to be in control, this picture shows a driver in the front part of the brain that's associated with self-regulation, known as the prefrontal cortex. It's about recognizing the need to be in control so that students can make good decisions to delay gratification, to organize, to plan. Certainly, there's been a lot of studies that have looked at self-regulation and academic achievement. We know that it's important for student success from elementary school through college. Self-regulation matters. What's not been clear is how it's linked to college readiness. And yet, anyone who's ever involved in the college planning process knows you need a lot of organization. You need a lot of time management. You need a lot of mapping and, and sort of planning for deadlines and tasks. Certainly, self-regulation matters for all those things. But it matters in some other ways, too. It matters in the ways that we talk to students about their ability to make choices about where they spend their time, about their choices about how they interpret experiences, how they reflect on what happens when they didn't do well in the PSAT. So I'd like to talk a little bit about three self-regulatory skills that I think have direct applications to college readiness. The first is planning. As I said, some people natural planners. There are two concepts within planning. The first is mental contrasting, and this comes from a researcher from Penn named Gabriel Oettingen. She talks about mental contrasting as a, a skill, a strategy, where students or people can imagine their futures within the context of their current reality. That is, what's the future I want and what might get in my way? What, is what does it look like right now? And to illustrate this point, I use the box of Dunkin' Donuts. Because where there is a teacher's room in Boston, there is a box of Dunkin' Donuts. I can attest to this. It's kind of like Starbucks, I think, around here. So if I know that I don't want to eat donuts, I'm trying not to eat donuts, but I know I'm going to see one in the teacher's room, mental contrasting is making a plan for not eating them. It's kind of like an if-then statement, teaching students to plan for obstacles, to take into account what might happen, so that they have the cognitive flexibility to do something when, it, when they're confronted with a barrier or when they're confronted with the reality. For some students, for some people, these researchers would argue, they become too focused on the reality and can't move towards the future. I would see this with students who would have babies in high school, that the reality of being a teen mom seemed inconsistent with going to college. That barrier seemed um, unable to overcome. Mental contrasting is teaching students to be adept, giving them that nimble ability to, to change, to, to act in the confrontation of, a, of an obstacle. The second is multiple pathways. And this, I think of this like the GPS system. When I put in, because you know I use this a lot, I need directions for a certain location, I'm usually given three routes, right? Route one, I never really know the difference between them. I'm sure there's one that's better. But the idea is that there are multiple ways to get to the same place. That kind of cognitive flexibility in teaching students that there's not one pathway to go to college, there's not one pathway to a particular career, allows them to change route, recast when something comes up that throws them off course. Otherwise, when something comes up, throws them off course, they just get off the pipeline. We want them to stay in the pipeline and just readjust. Teaching them multiple pathways. Think of this, you bring in speakers who talk about their path to college and they all represent the same path. What do students hear? There is one way to get a college degree. That we know that's not true. There are GED plus associate programs that allow students who've dropped out to get a GED plus an associate's degree. There are many pathways to a college degree. So planning is one self-regulatory skill. The second one is reflection or metacognition. And here I draw on the work of Zimmerman and others who think a lot about self-regulatory cycles. So what I hope you take from this are not the three words forethought, performance control, and reflection, but this idea of having students plan, do, and reflect. And that is teaching students to be able to reflect on what they've done and whether or not it worked. Zimmerman and his colleagues say that it's important that people plan for what they're doing and while they're doing it, sort of have this above 300 or maybe out of body experience where I'm thinking, how's this going? And then afterwards they reflect and think about what they've done differently. So if I use my talk today as an example, I made a plan for how I was gonna prepare. Right now I'm sort of wondering, how's this going? Are people falling asleep? Are they checking Facebook? Are they engaged? All the while trying to take in data about whether or not my plan worked. And afterwards, I might say to myself, you know what, you really didn't look at your notes very much. Why don't you save the paper and not print them out? Or that seemed to be a good example. They resonated with that example. We can do this with students. I once had a young man who works for the nonprofit called You Aspire, who does financial aid counseling, say to me, 
Mandy, this is all well and good, but how do I teach this kind of reflective stuff? All I'm doing is helping students fill out the FAFSA. And I said, well, Adam, he says I can use his name. I said, Adam, what happens when said student comes back to see you on your second appointment and doesn't bring mom, dad's tax forms? He says, well, I explained to them how important it is that we get the tax forms and how important it is that these forms are completed because without them, they can't get financial aid and the sooner we get in, and he goes on to explain this story and this lecture, if you will, that he gives to the student. And I said, do you think the student didn't know that? Do you think the student had the organizational skills? What if instead of saying that, you ask them to walk through what happened at the end of the day and talk through what happened when they got home, and identified what happened when he asked mom, or what happens if he didn't ask mom at all, so that he goes home with a different plan for how he's gonna to try to get the tax forms. Then maybe he'll come in with another problem, or he'll come in with the tax forms. Asking students to reflect on what worked and what didn't work. We do this in school all the time. What worked with, did, when you studied for this test? Did it work? What happens when you study the night before? Does that work? What happens when you start studying a week before? So building this reflective practice is just a habit we can teach to students that will serve them in school, in classrooms, and particularly once they get to college. And the last regulatory skill that I would talk about today is the delay of gratification. And if we had time, I'd show you a very good video, but I won't, because I know we're running low on time. The delaying of gratification is an important skill. We all know this. This is the thing that helps people put off instant or short-term gratification in favor of a longer-term outcome, right? In this case, the picture refers to a study done by Walter Mischel and his colleagues at Stanford years ago known as the Marshmallow Experiment. How many of you know the Marshmallow Experiment? If you're not familiar with it, go to the Google, as my grandmother used to call it, and look up the Marshmallow Experiment. What you'll find is that this researcher and his colleagues wanted to understand the ability to delay gratification among four and five-year-olds. So he brought an individual four or five-year-old into a room and gave him one marshmallow and said, I'm going to leave the room for 10 minutes, and when I come back, if you haven't eaten the marshmallow, I'm going to give you two. He wanted to understand whether or not the kids could delay the gratification by not eating the marshmallow in pursuit for two. So sure enough, he does this study, and they all were filmed, and when you watch, they're sort of remade versions of this. He found a couple things. One, he found that about, I think, almost three quarters of the students couldn't delay the gratification. And that, by the way, putting a marshmallow in front of a four and a five-year-old is kind of like putting a cup of coffee in front of an adult and asking them to wait four hours in the morning, if you're, if you're a coffee drinker, I should say. The other thing he found is that years later, he followed up on these same students, particularly the students who were able to delay the gratification. I should have said that the students who were, the kids who were able to delay gratification, one of the things they noticed from the videos is what they did to delay the gratification. Some of the kids started to look away. They wouldn't look at the marshmallow. They would like go like this. Some of the kids would start singing. Some of the kids would like pick up the marshmallow and start smelling it. <laughs> so that there were, but what I'm talking about here are coping mechanisms, strategies to delay the gratification. What can I do to avoid eating the marshmallow because I want two marshmallows? The second thing that he found, as I said, he followed up on the students years later, and lo and behold, not that you'll be surprised, he found that the students, the kids who had strong delays of gratification skills did better in school, they graduated at higher rates, went on to college at higher rates, and got degrees at higher rates than students who didn't have this skill. You might imagine this skill matters. It matters for all of us. When Suzanne and I do trainings on this topic, we often start by putting marshmallows, I'm sorry, not marshmallows, M&Ms on the table and ask people not to eat them until I get to this point in our talk, which as you can see, goes on for a while. <laughs> the delay of gratification is a hard thing to teach to students. And if you think about the context today where students are so adept at getting things quickly, they do texting, they get online and they get responses. The college students I study tell me they don't even use email because they don't wanna wait for someone to check their email and respond. It's Gchat or texting. But this is such a critical skill so that students can delay the gratification of working, delay the gratification of spending time with their friends in pursuit of a longer term goal, in waiting for the two marshmallows. When we think of self-regulatory skills, I draw off this point of this idea of doing to and for versus doing with. Building self-regulatory skills is hard because sometimes it means that things take longer. Let me tell you what I mean by this. One of the things that I did when students uh, would come to me and they'd fill out that FAFSA and then it would get lost in the backpack, I thought, well, why don't I just mail it for them? Then I'm sure it would go in and the stakes are pretty high. But of course, if I did that, and being the developmentalist that I was at the time but didn't know it, I recognized that I needed them to take responsibility. So instead, I started selling stamps in my office. 
I sold stamps and asked students to put the stamp on and walk it down the hall, not a very long hall, to the main office where there was an outgoing mail basket. Students took advantage of that and I scaffolded it for them. I didn't want to risk that it never got sent in. I didn't want to risk that it didn't happen, but I still needed to do something and not count on the fact that they'd do it on their own. I was talking with someone from a college access organization recently who said that they do a lot of support for essay writing. And one of the things they said that they do is that they print out the essay for students before the student arrives, so when the student arrives, they can get right to the work of working on the essay. Of course, it prompted me to say, why aren't you teaching students how to plan for a meeting? Well, it's for expediency. The sooner they're here, we can get going right away. Yes, it takes time. But teaching students how to plan for meetings that they need to print their essay out in advance is a good skill. So you've undermined their development in that area. So in thinking about this, it's about how do we do with students? How do we scaffold the kinds of things so we can help them build the self-regulatory skills that they need? Because we know that if they don't have them, they won't take advantage of the resources they have. So I go back to this, this circle, this cycle, and thinking about these developmental skills. I've talked a little bit about identity and motivation and self-regulation to sort of give you examples of the ways in which we can think about envisioning and believing in a way that's not about solely about raising aspirations, but about belief systems and different parts of identity. Talking particularly about aiming and motivation in a way that helps us think about the reasons that we can help students go to college. A nonprofit that I worked with recently used this new example of using a tree, visual, in the back and having students post leaves on the trees for all the different reasons that people might want to go to college, just to expand the ideas of why you might want to go beyond money. Using planning, organizing, and self-regulating, trying to build this into programming so that students can develop these skills. Sure, some of the students already have them. And one of the things I think is important to know is when kids are little, like my little ones, who regulates for them? I do. I decide when they eat, what they eat, and what they do with their time. When students get to college, who regulates what they do? They do. What happens in between? Teaching self-regulatory skills sets students up for success once they get to college. It's not just about helping them get in. So I'll end with this slide and say that very often when we think about students, we certainly understand that we would never design programs the same way for these two students. They're two different people and their chronological age is different. I talk to my four-year-old is very different than I talk to my seven-year-old. What she can understand cognitively is very different. But even when working with the same age students, we have to take into a developmental account of where they are, what their readiness for the information and the support is. I think that if we can pay attention to developmental skills in tandem with all the other things that we're doing, the academic supports, the informational supports, then we set people up to be ready to take advantage of all that we have, and they're able to act on the information and succeed in college. Thank you.